Okay, so we're good to start. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, as we go through today, feel free to ask questions. To ask questions, um, send them in using the question and answer box in the Zoom interface there. Um, and I will try to answer those um, probably towards the end. Um, we've got a lot of slides to get through. They're kind of technical, but go ahead and send them in as you have those questions. Um, and then I will get to them as I can. Um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're talking about Wi-Fi 6 and our uh, Wi-Fi 6 access points. So we'll start off by talking about Wi-Fi 6 in general, and then we're going to go ahead and, and, um, and talk about the hardware. And my phone is, Google Assistant is going off for some reason. Excellent. Um, so anyway, let's get started here. Um, so a brief history of Wi-Fi. So believe it or not, Wi-Fi got started all the way back in 1997, and it was just known as 802.11 back then. And believe it or not, Zysil did have 802.11 products all the way back then as well. Um, OFDM was introduced in 1999, and that gave us 802.11a. So um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, that's how we now think about Wi-Fi technologies is we think about the 11 and then the... Um, text afterwards telling us which revision of Wi-Fi it is. Um, 11G didn't come out until um, 2003, 11N in 2009, and then 11AC came out in 2013. Um, now, a key thing with 802.11AC that a lot of people aren't aware of is that it only improves performance on the five gigahertz radio. Um, in fact, the technology is only used on the 5 gigahertz radio. It doesn't work on the 2.4 radio. And then we have 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6, which was finally approved um, about a year ago. Now, one thing that's been interesting as we've gone through these different iterations is starting with 11n, you saw um, chipset vendors and hardware vendors rushing to market before the standard was finalized. So those of you that are old and decrepit like myself, you might remember the pre-11N products that came onto the market um, that were being advertised generally as pre-11N. Um, and some of those products were promised to be future upgradable to the full standard, but because they came out so early, um, it turned out that there was no way to firmware update them to the final version of the standard. We saw something kind of similar with 11AC. Um, so with 11AC, you had the first generation of 11AC, and then a few years later, they came out with Wave 2. So it was the same situation. Um, people basically rushing to market to be able to claim to have this new technology, 11AC, um, and sort of getting ahead of themselves as far as being able to implement that based on the, the standard itself. So a lot of these products came out before the standard was ratified um, and the chips themselves weren't capable of supporting all of the features. And we're, we've seen the same thing now with Wi-Fi 6. A lot of the early Wi-Fi 6 products um, are missing some of the key features that are part of Wi-Fi 6 and that was to get in there. So as I see here, you know, the final version of uh, ratification of 11AX took place a year ago, but you've had products calling themselves Um, and unlike 11AC, where we had wave one and wave two, and unlike 11N, where we had pre-N and true 11N, um, there is currently no industry-wide um, implementation of what can be called Wi-Fi 6 or, you know, an easy way to tell which products have the full Wi-Fi 6 feature set and which ones do not. Okay, so prior to Wi-Fi 6, um, Wi-Fi was what we call contention-based. It was basically a free-for-all um, of determining whose turn it was to broadcast or to use the currently available airtime. Each device needed to take turns using airtime, and if two or more used um, broadcast at the same time, you got interference and poor connectivity. So Wi-Fi 6 was designed to sort of solve some of these issues and make it a much more managed, much more equitable um, experience. So Wi-Fi 6 allows us to get up to 40% faster data rates for an individual user. 
It's designed to have four times the capacity and performance. Um, and so that means you can have more devices connected to the same access point. It also means you can have more access points in the same area um, without them causing interference like with older technologies or as much interference. And Wi-Fi 6 works on both that 2.4 and the five gigahertz radio. So you've now got improvements on both radios, unlike 11AC, where the improvements were only on the five gigahertz radio. And the theoretical maximum speed here with Wi-Fi 6 is 9.6 gigabits per second. So it's called 10 gig Wi-Fi. Although just like any other type of Wi-Fi, there's an enormous amount of overhead that goes into making Wi-Fi work as smoothly and quickly as it does. So you're still going to see a pretty large drop off um, when you do speed tests, because those speed tests aren't taking into account that overhead. So just to show you here what sort of like the real world improvements you can come across here. Um, we've got some scenarios here for us. Um, you've got a two by two, so two spatial streams, a device that supports two spatial streams and 80 megahertz channels. With 11N, the maximum data rate you would get would be 108 megabits per second. With 11AC wave two, that increased to 866 megabits per second. And now with Wi-Fi 6, 1.2 gigabits per second. So two spatial streams in each of these different technologies using 80 megahertz bandwidth. Same thing we see over here when it comes to um, four by four devices. So with a four by four device, with 11N, you would get up to 600 megabits per second. With 11AC, 1.7 gigabits per second. And now with Wi-Fi 6, it gets you up to 2.4 gigabits per second. So using the same amount of airtime and the same number of spatial streams, you can see pretty significant improvements as far as what uh, the maximum data rates you can come across. So some of these cool technologies that we have that make this possible are here up on the slide now. Um, so Wi-Fi 6, in theory, supports up to eight spatial streams, depending on the piece of hardware. And what's really nice here is we can do what's called multi-user MIMO, where each spatial stream can be directed to a different user. Now with 11AC Wave 2, you could only do that from the access point to multiple clients. But when, clients terms to, when it was clients' term to broadcast back to the AP, they had to take turns. So now with Wi-Fi 6, you've now got multi-user MIMO in both directions. So you can now have multiple clients transmitting data to the AP simultaneously, something you can't do on the older Wi-Fi technologies. We've increased or improved from OFDM to OFDMA in both directions, both upstream and downstream. Um, so this is something here that allows us to better allocate the available airtime and split it up between multiple users. So both, both of these are technologies that you're going to see are missing from some of the cheaper and older chipset-based Wi-Fi 6 solutions. Most of them do not do upstream MUMIMO. Most of them um, are only doing downstream OFDMA. Um, we have something called resource unit scheduling. So you can schedule when each individual uh, device is going to be their turn to broadcast instead of them just having to sort of guess and fight for it. Higher modulation rates. So we've, we're cramming more data into the same amount of space with that higher modulation. We have something called BSS frame coloring and TWT. So with TWT, that's great for um, Internet of Things devices where they don't use a lot of bandwidth, they aren't very active, like smart plugs and things like that. And it basically allows you to schedule them and say, hey, go ahead and go to sleep and wake up at this time, saving energy, saving battery. So some visual representations of some of this here. So this is our OFDM. A, so on the left there is OFDM. That's basically how we've been forced to, uh, to handle multi-user MIMO or multiple spatial streams is we would automatically break things up into chunks of at least 20 megahertz or a single Wi-Fi channel. With OFDMA, we get a lot more flexibility about how we allocate the different parts of the spectrum and we can allocate it down to chunks of uh, as small as I believe it's two megahertz. So a lot of flexibility there for better utilization of your airtime. So BSS coloring, that allows us to have more APs and more users in the same area and sort of reduce the interference. And it does this by assigning information to the packets that basically identify who this packet is uh, intended for. 
So it allows um, a device to be able to basically say, hey, that packet isn't for me. I can ignore it and continue listening for packets that are intended for me. So it allows devices on different access points, but using the same frequency, um, it sort of reduces the amount of interference that you're gonna run into there. So here's a good example sort of showing how when you put it all together. So basically on this chart here, we are, we are uh, measuring aggregated throughput. The light yellow or light orange bar up top is Wi-Fi 6. The orange bar here is 11AC or Wi-Fi 5. And as we go across here to the right, we're adding more and more users to the same access point. And as you see here with 11AC, because it's contention-based and there's not a lot of coordination and you're missing some of these technologies for sharing airtime, as you add users to an access point, your aggregated throughput actually goes down. Where with Wi-Fi 6, as you add more and more devices to there, the aggregated throughput remains essentially unchanged. So I sort of talked about it earlier here. Well, when is Wi-Fi 6 not Wi-Fi 6? Um, so the challenge is there's really nobody who enforces using the name Wi-Fi 6 or 11 AX. Um, so you are free to call your product Wi-Fi 6, regardless of how much of the Wi-Fi 6 standard you are using. Now, there is an industry group called the Wi-Fi Alliance, and they do um, allow you to get your product certified as Wi-Fi 6. So to use their logo, you have to go through their testing process. Um, but even then, in the early days of that logo, some key features were missing that needed to get that logo that they've only recently added in the last few months to their testing procedure. So those older products will have the logo, but they will be missing features and they aren't required to add those features to continue using the logo. So some of this was just the case of getting silicon out onto the, the market early. Um, and some of it has been with some of the newer chips that are specifically aimed at the sort of consumer or prosumer space, um, the, those inexpensive access points and routers. Um, so they might be missing some of the features. So this is just showing a comparison here between the Qualcomm Gen 1 Wi-Fi 6 chips and the Qualcomm Gen 2 Wi-Fi 6 chipsets. So all of our products are going to be a Gen 2, so support, excuse me, all of our um, business, true business class products are going to be using these uh, Gen 2 chips that offer the full support for the Wi-Fi 6 feature set. Um, another thing to keep in mind out there is some vendors are only putting the Wi-Fi 6 features onto the five gigahertz radio. So you are buying uh, a Wi-Fi 6 access point, it's what it's marketed as, but the 2.4 radio is still using 11N technology. So for instance, Ubiquity on some of their products, that's what they do to help keep the cost down, is they're only putting the Wi-Fi 6 chip on the five gigahertz radio and you're still using a cheaper 11N chip for the 2.4 radio. And now lastly, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of this, there is something new called Wi-Fi 6E. So Wi-Fi 6E isn't a new standard. Um, the E stands for extension. And basically it allows you to use Wi-Fi 6 technology on a six gigahertz radio. So right, traditionally we have 2.4 and five. The FCC um, opened up a chunk of spectrum, a very large chunk of spectrum in the six gigahertz space for Wi-Fi utilization. So products that are marketed as Wi-Fi 6E can use that E or the Wi-Fi 6 on that six gigahertz channel. Speeds are the same, the technology is same. The only thing that's changing is the spectrum or frequencies that we are using. So this unlocks a lot of spectrum for us. It gives you access to seven non-overlapping 160 megahertz channels. So if you've ever sat through my uh, my Wi-Fi 101 webinars, you'll know that part of the way we increase speeds is we keep increasing the amount of bandwidth that's being used um, at a time. And with the five gigahertz spectrum, we only had the ability to use two 160 megahertz channels. So as soon as you had three devices or three different APs operating using 160 megahertz channels, you would have interference because they would be overlapping with each other. So now with Wi-Fi 6E, you've got seven non-overlapping 160 megahertz channels to use. So again, it helps you in situations where you've got a lot of APs in the same area as you can use the maximum amount of bandwidth without causing interference. Now, 
much like why our uh, five gigahertz has those DFS uh, channels that were already being used by legacy devices. Wi-Fi 6E is the same. Um, that spectrum was already being used by utility companies, by mobile news reporters and other devices um, out there. So when you are using Wi-Fi 6E outdoors, you have to implement something called automatic frequency control. So because of that, at least at the moment, there aren't any Wi-Fi 6E outdoor products. So Wi-Fi 6E for the moment is limited to indoor use. And that's because um, they're still hashing things out about outdoor, using outdoor and what you need to do and how it needs to work and what certification you need. It's coming, it's coming probably before the end of the year, um, but you are gonna see a while before you get Wi-Fi 6E outdoor products. Uh, one thing you may be seeing in the future is products being Wi-Fi 6E future upgradable. So they've got the chip, they've got the radio, they've got the antennas, but it isn't implemented until um, everything gets settled down as to the regu regulatory requirements. So then you'll see a firmware update or something like that um, to get them to be able to use their 6E radio outdoors. Now, there are some trade-offs with Wi-Fi 6E. So one of the things that you run across here as, as radio frequencies go up, the range is lessened. So now we're going from 2.4 to 5. Remember, there was a pretty significant drop off as far as range goes. You're going to see a similar drop off from 5 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz. Um, in particular, it doesn't like going through obstructions. It doesn't like going through walls or people or things like that. Um, another challenge you run into, which also affects range, is that the power limitations are significant here. You're limited to basically 23 dBm or 200 milliwatts of output power, unlike 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, where you could get up to 4 watts of output power. Very few devices did that, but you had that. And it, it's pretty normal to see a lot of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz devices operating between 500 milliwatts to um, one watt of output power. Um, so you're gonna have frequency limitations here because the power is much less. So two things to keep in mind. Um, and then just in general, you're gonna run into situations where if you want to support all three bands simultaneously, 2.4, 5, and 6 at full speed, um, you need a really beefy central processor to handle that much bandwidth and throughput. So you're going to find true Wi-Fi 6E products um, are going to be quite expensive. So one of the ways that we're trying to keep, keep that from getting too expensive is a lot of products will basically allow you to only use two bands at a time. So you will decide, do you want to use a 5 gigahertz or do you want to use 6 gigahertz? And then, of course, in order to use Wi-Fi 6E, um, products need to, client devices need to be able to support six gigahertz. So um, for instance, I have a uh, Pixel, Google Pixel 6 Pro, it does support Wi-Fi 6E, but I believe the latest version of the iPhone, the 12, does not. I think that's the latest version. Um, I believe the next version of the iPhone coming out in the fall um, is expected to finally support Wi-Fi 6E, but the point being that there's not going to be a lot of compatible devices out there for that six gigahertz spectrum, um, probably for quite a bit of time. Okay, so that's it for the technology as far as Wi-Fi 6 goes. And again, if you have questions for those of you that joined late, there is a question and answer interface in Zoom. Feel free to send in questions there or correct me if I got something wrong. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about Zycel. So when we're looking at our products, our access points, we have two two broad categories here, Nebula Flex and Nebula Flex Pro. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Nebula, it is our free cloud managed networking platform. So think of something like a Meraki type cloud management system um, that you can use and ours is free. Um, we do sell licenses that unlock some additional features, but the core version is free and has no limitations on the number of devices or customers you can manage in the cloud. Um, so when you're looking at our products, though, they'll either be Nebula Flex or Nebula Flex Pro. So Nebula Flex Pro, or excuse me, Nebula Flex just by itself there, means you can manage the device standalone like you would traditionally manage an AP, you go to its IP address, log into the GUI, or you can choose to manage it in our free cloud there for you. Products that are called Nebula Flex Pro, 
We unlock a third management mode, which is being managed by a wireless LAN controller, the more traditional way of handling business type deployments, right? Rather than having to manage dozens of APs, you simply have a local controller on the network, all the APs talk to it, and it handles configuration of the individual access points. So when you see a product listed as Nebula Flex Pro, that's telling you it supports all three modes, standalone, controller, or cloud managed. And Nebula Flex Pro products also include one year of our Nebula Pro license. So that's a license aimed more towards MSPs that unlocks some additional features such as like uh, audit logs, a year's worth of log information in the cloud, email alerts when devices are go offline, things like that. So that comes bundled with the device if it's Nebula Flex Pro. You don't have to use it, but it is bundled there with you. So now we'll start talking about the hardware. Um, it's kind of complex and confusing here towards the lower end. Um, oh, Wayne has a question. I'll go ahead and Wayne answer your question right now. So Wayne is asking about those controllers if you wanna do controller managed. Um, so we had what's called the NXC platform. That was our dedicated wireless LAN controller. And we do still have a few of those sitting around if you want some. Um, I wanna say they could manage up to 512 devices. Um, so those are there, but for the most part, um, what we're using these days as that wireless LAN controller is our security appliances. So most of our USG, Flex, ATP, um, VPN series um, security gateways have the ability to work as a wireless LAN controller. They will include a small number of APs out of the box, and then we sell licenses to unlock additional management. So we can manage up to a depending on which one of our security appliances you're looking at, we can manage over a thousand access points on one controller. Um, we also have the ability to manage remote devices. So the, the controller doesn't necessarily have to be on the same physical network um, as the APs it is managing. Um, but that's a conversation for a different day, but yeah. So for the most part, it is going to be our NXC 2500, which is that standalone device. It, it has been essentially phased out, but we do still have some stock. Um, but otherwise it's going to be our security appliances and you can use those solely as a wireless LAN controller or you can use them as a security VPN UTM appliance and a wireless LAN controller. Okay, so now let's go back to the hardware. So historically we've broken up our access points here into two categories. We are now with this year in 2022, we are splitting it into three categories. And the lower end is kind of confusing, so I'll do my best to explain it here for you. Um, but we've got what's called simplicity, or what we're calling the simplicity class of products. Um, not my choice on naming, um, but it is going to be those products that are aimed more at the consumer or self-install uh, market. So stuff like the lower end Ubiquity products, TP-Link products, um, probably our biggest competitor in this space um, would be Netgear and their uh, low end Wi-Fi 6 devices. Then we've got our flexibility series and the ultimate series. So those are going to be the products that I say are, are probably the products you as a VAR or system integrator are most interested in would be the flexible and ultimate series. And we'll go through those and sort of what the differences are. So we'll start with simplicity. So there are three models here, the NWA50AX, the NWA55AXE, and the NWA90AX. So I consider these to be Wi-Fi 6 Lite. So like most of, many of the other products down here in this lower end price point spectrum, um, there are features in Wi-Fi 6 that are not supported. There are also some features of uh, Nebula that are not supported, but all of these are Nebula Flex. They can be managed in Nebula. So um, the NWA55AXE is an outdoor Wi-Fi 6 device, um, and then the 50 and the 90 are indoor devices. So to try to sort of simplify and explain the differences, I've got this slide here. I know the text is kind of small, and I apologize for that, um, but let's go through it. So We've also added one of the APs here from the flexible lines to give you some examples of what the differences are. So all four APs up here are AX1800. So two spatial streams on both radios, 
Both of them are a Wi-Fi 6 chipset on both radios. Um, however, when the NWA50 and the NWA55, these are currently Amazon only. Um, if you're interested in the outdoor AP, talk to your salesperson. We may be able to do something for you. But it's just because these are really low price and the price point fluctuates a lot. And it's just difficult to manage that through distribution, as well as just the chipset shortages we have right now. Um, so how does this differ from the 90, which is also, again, an AX1800 product? Um, and the answer here is going to be when it comes to your net, your management here. So the 50 and the 55 AXE do not support um, WPA Enterprise, whether it's WPA2 or WPA3. So if you want to support that user authentication as part of your security, you need to go up to the 90. Um, Mac-based authentication or Mac filtering cannot be done on the 50 series, but can be done on the 90 series. Captive portal cannot be done on the 50 series, but it can be done on the 90 series. Um, so those are the main differences between the 50 and the 90 series, and the 90 is available through distribution for you. Hold on a second here. Um, and now all three of those, the 50 and the 90, are missing some of the Wi-Fi 6 features. So they don't support like upstream MUMIMO, I believe, um, some of the other things like that. Um, also, these products here, unlike most of our business class products, are only a two-year warranty. Whereas traditionally, our business class APs are lifetime warranty. So these products aimed at this more consumer space are only two years. So going up to the NWA 11, or excuse me, the 110AX, it's got all of the features of the 90, plus the ability to do dynamic pre-shared key, plus the ability to do load balancing, plus the ability to use our optional um, connect and protect uh, Wi-Fi security program comes with a lifetime warranty. And on the Wi-Fi 6 side of things, it supports the full feature set of Wi-Fi 6. So I hope that makes some sense for you. I hope I explained that well enough that you understand what's going on there. Um, so that's it as far as the low end goes, that 50 and the 90. So going up from there to our simplicity and ultimate series, let's start talking about the hardware. And this is, this is our true, you know, historical business class AP selection here. So when you're looking at these products, we build these products differently than most of our competition does. Um, those of you that have met us at a trade show, you may have been lucky enough where we've had our product on display as well as Ubiquity and Ruckus, and we've had you pick them up, we've opened them up for you, but just picking up and holding our product, you will feel that ours weighs a lot more. So why is that? And it has to do with our design philosophy here of making the product last. So with a solid state product like this, one of the major causes of failure is going to be heat fatigue. Heat fatigue can cause the little micro switches inside your ICs to fail. Um, it can also cause problems with uh, your solder joints failing if you've got uh, heat cycling, causing things to expand and contract. So the way we deal with that is to begin when we've got a lot of vent holes on the top of our access points to allow heat out. Some of our cheaper competition has no vent holes. We also then have a giant metal plate that's designed to draw that heat off the PCBA and off the chips and vent it out those holes. Most of our competition doesn't have anything like that. We also here have only used solid state capacitors. We do not use any electrolytic capacitors because those tend to fail after a few years um, or run the risk of it. They can dry out, they can boil over, they can burn up. So we do not use electrolytic capacitors. We only use solid state capacitors. So that's why we can offer a lifetime warranty on our cheaper access points like the NWA 110 AX, which sells for what, $140, $150. We also use this on our Wi-Fi 5 business class AP. So even like the $99 NWA 1123 ACV3 is constructed like this. You will also see a lot more shielding on our PCBA versus looking at our competitors when you open them up. And that's because normally shielding is there um, to help protect from uh, electromagnetic interference from other components on the board. 
we throw in additional shielding to help filter out 4G and 5G noise. So 4G and 5G can operate on frequencies that border Wi-Fi, and there can be bleed over, especially in larger buildings where you've got repeaters set up throughout the building to try to extend the uh, 4G and 5G signal indoors. So our filters help protect us from that. The other thing you will see is we do not mount our antennas directly to the PCBA, even, you know, $1,500 ruckus APs put their antennas onto the PCBA. We mount them on their own board separate from the main PCBA and put a noise spreader between the board and those antennas. So that gives us better isolation of those antennas and helps us with the signal to noise ratio, getting you a little bit better signal to noise ratio than you have, would have without it. So now our true Wi-Fi 6 business class portfolio is all of these guys here, our NWA110AX, our NWA210AX, which are part of that um, flexible series. And then on the ultimate series here, we have the WAX510, 610, 630, and 650. So we'll start to go through some of these here for you. So we'll start here with our Nebula Flex products, the flexible products or flexibility as they call it. Um, so this is the NWA 110 and 210. Um, both are true Wi-Fi 6, both radios, the full Wi-Fi 6 feature set. Um, main differences between the two are going to be the speed. The NWA 110AX is a AX1800 class product where the 210AX is an AX3000 class product. Because of the speed difference, we have also improved the ethernet uh, or upgraded the ethernet connection on this. So the NWA 110AX has one one gig ethernet port. The 210 offers a 2.5 gigabit ethernet port. Um, and it also offers a one gig pass through port. So you can run ethernet into this, power this up, and then run another cable from this to another device nearby, um, basically turning this into a, like sort of like a uh, two port switch kind of. But the key thing here is that 2.5 gig ethernet connection. Because you're in theory getting speeds up to 3000 on the wireless, you need more than just a standard one gig connection. Um, so you aren't using your, so your wired connection isn't throttling your Wi-Fi connection. Going up here to our ultimate series, our Nebula Flex Pro products are the 510 and 610D. Similar to the uh, NWAs we just talked about, um, main differences here are gonna be Wi-Fi speed, AX1800 here, AX3000 here. And just like with that previous model, this has a one gig ethernet port. This has a 2.5 gig uplink and then a one gig pass-through port. The main difference between these and the NWAs is these have our dual optimized antenna technology. Now I've got a slide and I'll explain what that is. Um, and these are Nebula Flex Pro, so they include one year of the Pro Pack bundled with them. So dual optimized antennas. Uh, for those of you that are new to Zycel or Zycel products, it's a technology that we offer on our access, some of our access points. It's designed to solve one of the conundrums you run into. So traditionally an access point has a fixed antenna pattern and it's optimized under the idea that you're gonna be mounting this access point on a ceiling directly over the area that needs to be covered. Unfortunately, out here in the real world, you know, you can't always do that and you often end up having to install your access point on a wall. So it's on the wall, but the antenna pattern is optimized for that ceiling mount. So what happens is, is you end up sending a lot of the signal up into the ceiling, down into the floor. If you're in a multi-floor building, you can cause interference with your neighbors upstairs or downstairs, and you don't get the coverage that you're expecting in the area you want. So our solution to this is that dual optimized antenna technology, which is on the 510 and the 610. Um, and that a lot has, two different sets of antennas, one optimized for ceiling, one optimized for the wall. And then you can choose which one you want to use where you've, based on where you've installed that device. So it's a switch in the software. There's also a physical switch that you can use um, basically to say, hey, this one's being mounted on the ceiling, use the ceiling antenna. Oh, this one's being mounted on the wall, use the uh, wall mount antenna pattern. 
So going up from there, we have the 630S and the 650S. So the 630S is very similar to that WAC 610D. It's an AX3000 product. It has a 2.5 gig uplink port. It has a one gig pass-through port. The benefit of this though is our smart antenna technology. Um, our WAC 6303 D-S um, is on its final days. That was our old, uh, most affordable 11 AC smart antenna access point. And this would be considered the replacement for that, the WAC 630S. Um, so this will become our most affordable smart antenna access point that we have once the uh, sell out of the remaining 11 AC product. And then a step up from that is our WAC 650S. So this is an AX3550 technology. So it's faster. So how is it getting faster? So when we're looking at these, generally we look at spatial streams. So the WAC 510D supports two spatial streams on both radios. The WAC 610 and the WAC, WAC 630 support two spatial streams on the 2.4 radio, but four spatial streams on the five gigahertz radio. And then going up to the 650S, we now support four spatial streams on both radios. So both the 2.4 and 5 have it. Um, so we've got an even faster access point here for us. So because of that, our uplink port has been improved to five gigabits. So you've now got a five gig uplink port to make sure your wired connection is not the bottleneck to your wireless users. In addition, it has some technology that none of our other access points do. And that is one is a built-in BLE Bluetooth radio. So that is for use with BLE applications. It's, I think, primarily used in retail for tracking. But it is there. So if you have an opportunity where you need a built-in Bluetooth radio, the WAC 650 is what you're looking at. The WAC 650S also has a dedicated third radio that is just for scanning purposes. Um, so, you know, traditionally when you are using um, five gigahertz and if you are using DFS channels, if you detect a legacy device using the same channel as you, you're required to stop broadcasting and switch to another channel. So that third radio allows that to happen much more quickly and smoothly by knowing which other channels are currently not being used by uh, legacy equipment so you can quickly move over to them instead of having to disconnect, scan, and then allow your users to reconnect on the new channel. If you are using our controllers, so like uh, the, you know, the local area controller, that third radio can also be used as a dedicated um, rogue AP detection radio. So that is it as far as our hardware goes. I wanna talk briefly about Smart Antenna for those of you that aren't too familiar with it. Um, when it comes in the industry, it's really just us and Ruckus that use smart antenna technology. So if you, you haven't used Ruckus, you're probably not that familiar with it. If you have used Ruckus, it's very similar to their Beam Flex Plus. So again, your traditional access points have a single fixed antenna pattern that they use that's designed to be under the idea that your AP is mounted on the ceiling above the area to be covered. So we'll, we'll skip, for instance, talking about, you know, placement not always being ideal for the antenna pattern, um, and also talk now a little bit about interference issues. So there are, in the real world, other sources of RF interference. It can be other access points. Um, it can be basically anything that's wireless, because anything that's wireless is probably using 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, even if it's not Wi-Fi. Microwaves use 2.4 to cook, and various types of industrial equipment can put out interference on all sorts of different frequencies. So in this scenario here, we've got your traditional single pattern ceiling mount antenna, and we've got a source of noise. In this illustration, it's a microwave, but it can be just about anything. And what happens is when it starts putting out interference, it interferes with the ability of the access point to be able to detect the signals being sent to it and degrades the performance. So with smart antenna, we have the ability to use not just one antenna pattern, like a traditional AP, or two antenna patterns, like with our dual optimized antenna, but we have hundreds of antenna patterns that we can use. So in a clean room environment, we use those antenna patterns to focus the beam and the signal 
to each individual user. So each user is using a different antenna pattern based on where they are in relation to the AP and the RF environment. But our, our smart antenna doesn't take into account just where the devices are. We look at and find interference and tailor the antenna pattern to avoid that interference. So we can go through a nearly real time different antenna patterns and kick, stick with the antenna pattern that's going to provide the best coverage based on focusing the signal to where that user is, but also based on basically ignoring sound or other interference coming from different directions, whether it's another access point or what have you. Um, it doesn't require anything special on the client side. It is wholly done on the access point itself. Um, if you join our uh, Wi-Fi 101 webinar, I go into a lot more detail sort of and give you some examples, real world testing that we've done, showing you how this works. There's also some third party testing that's been done um, as well by, for instance, the University of Brescia, um, their networking group a few years ago did a really thorough analysis of us, Ruckus, and then Cisco and, and uh, HP. So Cisco and HP don't have smart antenna, we do. Um, so we'll go through some of the competitors real quick. So this is just showing you here our WAC 510D. Um, this is again, a AX 3000, or excuse me, AX 1800 class device. So we're comparing it here to the Aruba AP505 and Ingenious here, um, they're 357 and 220 um, access points. So all of these are the same AX 1800 class products. All of these are dual band. Um, so first difference here is this is a true Wi-Fi 6 feature set. Um, the Ingenious product is missing out on upstream OFDMA, upstream MUMIMO, and BSS coloring. So it does not support those features. It's using an older Gen 1 chipset in it. Um, this is also true of Netgear's low-end uh, access points. So ours offers dual optimized antennas, where HP and Ingenious just offer your traditional static antenna pattern. You'll see we offer higher output power on both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radio, helping us extend the range beyond what you would get with those other products. Um, all of us have one gig uh, ethernet uplink ports there and are PoE based. Um, you can see our product can be used standalone controller or in the cloud. It's roughly the same for HP. Ingenious, however, has two different models. So if you want to use a software controller, you have to buy one version. If you want to use the cloud, you have to buy a different version. So here's some speed test comparisons here. Um, this is comparing in blue is going to be HP Aruba. And then in yellow is using an antenna mount pattern. And then the orange is a ceiling mount, or excuse me, wall mount. And I'm not sure where exactly they had this set up. Um, but you can see um, we outperformed uh, Aruba um, in our speed test there. We'll do a WAC 650S competitor here. So this is sort of like our flagship AP. It's a four by four Wi-Fi six. So that compares with the Cisco 9115, the Meraki MR45, HP Aruba's 535, and the Ruckus R750. So all of these are basically uh, the same Wi-Fi 6 technology, but only us and Ruckus have that smart antenna. If you look at power output, we have the highest power output of all of the different brands on the 2.4 radio. And in the case of the five gigahertz radio, we are tied with Ruckus and us and Ruckus are higher output power than all of our, all the other competitors there. We have a dedicated monitoring radio that is not offered by any of those other models. Um, all of these models offer that Bluetooth BLE. And only us and Aruba offer that five gig uplink port. With Ruckus, you still have just a 2.5 gig. And with Cisco, you have just a 2.5 gig. So you may see some performance issues where you can't fully maximize your wireless throughput there. We have a one gig uh, pass through port. Cisco does not offer that or Meraki. And again, this works with all three modes there for us. So here's some comparisons. Again, we're comparing us with HP Ruba. Um, and as you can see here um, on the 2.4 radio, significantly better performance thanks to the smart antenna and the higher output power um, versus what Aruba can do, even though um, 
You know what? I'm going to take that back. This is probably a bad slide to use. The Aruba is only a two by two on the 2.4 when we're four by four. I'm not sure if we also used it only two by two client devices. So let's skip that. Maybe I should pull that slide out. Let's go to the five gigahertz. That's a much more fair comparison. So with five gigahertz mode, both the us and the Aruba are four by four. Um, so you can see here, just like the other slide, still significant improvements. So they're both four by four. In theory, they should be the same speed. Um, but because of that smart antenna technology, because of the higher output power, because of the better isolation on our antennas, we are out, able to outperform Aruba at every different testing point. Um, and now just some final words here for you. Um, we highly recommend on a lot of our Wi-Fi 6 products that you pair them with the XS1930-12HP. Um, this is a multi-gig PoE switch. So it can support the 2.5 and those five gigabit uplink ports on all of our Wi-Fi 6 APAs as well as one gigs. Um, it also supports 802.3 BT PoE. So it can provide 60 watts of PoE power per port. So this one is our is our only current switch, I believe, that can fully speed or fully power the WAX 650S. If you plug the WAX 650S into an 11AT, uh, or excuse me, 802.3AT um, PoE device, it'll still run, it just run at a slower speed. Um, we also do offer injectors, both 30 watt injectors and 60 watt injectors, if you're just doing a couple APs. And this is what our mounting bracket looks like. Basically, it's been optimized here for you, um, so you can easily mount the, uh, the mounting bracket onto a wall or ceiling and then snap the AP into it. The screw holes are designed so it can screw directly into a standard round junction box or a outlet box, um, such as you might find on the wall. So we've got two sets of uh, screw patterns there that are designed to handle both, including both sizes of round junction boxes that may be out there. Um, we also sell a very inexpensive accessory, which are T-bar mounting clips, which basically I'll clip onto the T-bars that hold up your traditional office drop ceiling. So then this connects to those, and then the AP connects to this. You can see there a little animation showing you. And with that, guys, that is the end of today's webinar. I don't have any pending questions, but I'll stick around here for a minute to answer the, any that come in. Um, as we wait for some to come in, um, take a look at our user forums, forum.zycell.com. Like other, user, other vendors, user forums are designed to allow you to interact with other Zycell users. These forums, though, are also monitored by our headquarters product management and R&D team, so they will sometimes wade in and answer questions for you. It is also a good place to go for latest uh, release notes, security advisories, things like that. They get posted there first. Um, anonymous attendee has a question here for us. Is band steering a standard option for all of these devices? So band steering can be done on all of our true business class products. So everything from the NWA 110 up to the WAC 650S supports band steering. Um, so yes, that, that is something you absolutely can do. Um, I do not remember off the top of my head if the uh, those that sort of prosumer or simplicity class products, I can't remember if they support um, band steering or not. Um, but definitely everything 110 and higher does. That was, it looks like my only question. Um, We'll hold off here for just another minute in case some more are coming in. Um, but feel free to email me directly, seanr at zycel.com with any questions you may have offline, um, as well as suggestions for other webinar topics, corrections, um, anything you may have, feel free to reach out to me or um, always just reach out to your salesperson, Jacob, Andy, David, Try, and they can always forward stuff to me. Um, it doesn't look like I've got any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Again, if you do have something that you're still working on typing up, just go ahead and uh, just email it to me again. It's Sean R. Sean is spelled S-H-A-W-N, then the letter R at Zycel.com. Thanks, everybody.